Well, this is recording. I guess that's just, that's what well, that's as good as it's gonna be for today. Um, sorry about that. It's I think right. we got the conversation, but uh, I mean, I'm sometimes sure it helps to start over from scratch with philosophy, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Suppose yeah. none of that just happened. Yeah. What's on your mind? Um, <laughs> just like kind of feeling stressed out about the the camera, I guess. At this point. About the camera. Um, a little bit like self-recriminating, like, uh, oh man, I should have done this X, Y, and Z before coming here and made sure this, this, and that worked, but. Well, you know, I failed to record something the other day because I just, I set up all the stuff and I didn't click one button. Oh. Yeah, it's, um. I saw a podcast the other day where this happened, so, like, I saw, like, the second half of a conversation. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, like, it's, oh. it's, it's a little rough well, when it happens. Or the reverse when you're accidentally live streaming and you don't want to be. Oh, that's even worse. <laughs> yeah, uh, that could be a problem. Yeah, I mean, it's all, it's like how, like writing a paper and then the computer crashes and you lose the whole thing. But I guess it's not as bad because it's more casual. Yeah, I mean, knowing me, I'll probably repeat myself with some of these topics. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> a couple of those things, you know, they just they keep coming back to them. Yeah, no, it's cool stuff, though. Like, I, well, like I'm, I'm getting I'm, a lot out of it. What I was saying a second ago is that worker-owned cooperatives are legal in Canada. Okay. Even though, and, and there are some are successful, like the Mondragon co-op. Um, but, it, and, and um, it would come down to the voting system used. Right. Um, and in some cases, uh, you would want something more like liquid democracy, where you can, although there's a representative that you vote in, when they start screwing up, you just revoke your vote and give it to somebody else and be like, okay, I vote for this person now. Like, for instance, if we had liquid democracy in the federal level in Canada, people could say, okay, we're going to vote for Justin Trudeau because he's campaigning on electoral reform. Right. And then he doesn't do it, so then they can say, okay, we switch our vote now to right. someone who says they will. You right. know, if, if, for instance, you know, the majority saw that as, like, a deal breaker. Right. Or whatever that issue is. Okay. Now, you might say that, you know, every decision made that way, maybe... Maybe we should have a fluid rep and a four-year rep, you know, mm -hmm. uh, for each level. I mean, that gets confusing if it's every level of government, I guess, but, you know, I think it makes sense on some level to have, you know, I just, we had the, the fixed PM and the PM du jour <laughs> uh, of, like, you know, you can, okay. the, as opinion changes, the, 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 that one representative changes and they're in charge of, like, more short-term decisions. Yeah, actually, that's a really interesting idea. Like, so you could have even, like, uh, I guess it could be a whole spectrum of, like, uh, I mean, in a way, I guess it does, we do have, like, a federated system that's a little bit like that. But not really, though. No, it's not it's time scale. The time scale is the same, scale. actually, yeah. yeah. It's just locality, so. But yeah, having it be stratified by Yeah. time scale is a really interesting idea. I mean... Yeah, I mean, uh, this is one of the principles the Pirate Party runs on, but you, you could have this kind of principle in a worker-owned cooperative as well for the votes that would happen uh, internally. Like, there's the votes you do for election, the votes you do for what to do with the profits of the company you work for, if it's that kind of setup. Mm -hmm. And uh, the devil's in the details in terms of the voting systems, which is why there needs to be experimentation, because you can't solve it, I think, just theoretically, and say, like, oh, we're going to consider theoretically all the possible 
voting systems, I mean, say, say systems of government, we're going to sit here theoretically, we're going to prove intellectually which is better once and for all, communism or capitalism or whatever. Right. And, and, and before you get into any experimentation, well, guess what? I mean, that's not how the scientific method works, which is supposed to be some of our best knowledge. <laughs> and it involves constantly experimenting, iterating over and over again. Yeah, I mean, um, okay, well, well, I mean, I'm kind of curious in this conversation, like, where do you fall on the, like, political spectrum? Uh, I guess I'm pretty left. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, it, maybe you should ask me a diagnostic question, like, view on some <laughs> topic. I mean. A Karl Marx, yes or no? Yes or no. I mean, um, I, I should read more of him someday. Okay. Um, I mean, the, the concept of alienation makes some sense to me. Here, here, let's have some more serious one. Uh, free, um, free trade. What do you think of free trade? Well, I'm in favor of it when it comes to people. Uh, like, I'm in favor of free movement of people. Okay. So, I guess you could say, well, goods don't have the same rights that people do, but what about the rights of the people to the goods? I mean, I, I guess um, where you live makes a bigger difference than what shit you can buy. So, like, it's not as much of an argument on the freedom side of things so like the because I I, because I would have okay okay, look I I've started to take to a phrase something like methodological anarchism uh, which is just applying the method of questioning power and it's basically Chomsky's definition of anarchism that you that you have to place the burden of proof on those who think a power difference should exist Um, and so that's a method Um, and so you could call it uh, methodological anarchism I think that I've started to find that makes it clear to people that I'm talking about a method, not like a state of there being no state or right. something like that. Just it's a method of like because people can get behind that. People do understand it of like questioning power. You did it when you were a teenager, you know. <laughs> okay, so so is it? How would that be different from just um, if I'm going through life and I uh, I don't take things on other people's authority. I just um, judiciously decide which systems I want to be a part of and stuff like that. Like, is, is that based in methodological anarchism or is there more to it? Well, you'll encounter power differences in that process okay. of living, and you can question them as you encounter them. We can, can I accept some power differences yes. and be like, yeah, I see why this one's beneficial? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, like, for instance, um, arguably there's a power difference if you give women the right to choose, um, but I think that's a justified power difference. You know, okay. Probably because women bear more of the consequences of childbirth. So, and, okay. you know, it, it's actually, I think, good epistemology, never mind all of the other ethical considerations. It's like the people who experience the effects are going to make better decisions in general. Um, and so because women experience the effects of those decisions more directly, you know, they're, they're, they're closer to the source of information about what should be done. Um, so I think there's an epistemic argument in favor of uh, pro-choice in that way. And, it's, you know, and, and in that case, the power difference is justified via an argument such as that one and many other ar- arguments besides. Um, you know, um, and I think some people might, I, mean, I posted this when there was the van attack in Toronto, um, saying that, because, you know, people are talking about trying to, like, dissect incel ideology or whatever. And right, basically an incel killed, like, nine people with a van in Toronto. And um, so, like, um, wh- one, one thing I think, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's always a dangerous exercise trying to make sense of insanity. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, it's a horrible thing, but... Um, I, I think in, in some uh, parts of that kind of ideology, there is this question, this kind of anarchist question of like, well, why, you know, why should women have this say in you know, my life? Cause yeah, okay, sure, people's choices do affect your life. Yeah, it's true. Um, but some of those are their personal boundaries and some of them are your personal boundaries. And like, there's reasons. And in the case of, say, pro-choice, I think there's you know, kind of some of the reasons that I gave and all these other reasons. And, um, you know, you can ask the question, but you have to ask the question soon enough to get the answer, to learn the answer, because there is such a thing as justified power. It's not like all power differences are unjust. You know, like, to take another example of, like, questioning capitalism okay. or something like that. Like, oh, there's this power that uh, capitalism has because it's this sort of has this global dominance, you know, mm-hmm. and you might say what what justifies, what, what justifies that. And, you know, um, compared to what, you know, compared to just, like, disobeying the rule of law generally, I think that's probably, you could probably make an easy argument that, like, you know, um, you need something better than just just ignoring those rules, and so there's some justification 
when you don't have the alternative uh, available to continue on with, with the status quo, but you also have the obligation to keep questioning it. Okay. Um, and and m merely, merely, um, mer merely getting the answer that a power difference is unjustified doesn't prove that the switching cost is worth it. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's such really as with point. rent control in Toronto, whereas if you move from, say, an abusive relationship, you might pay double the rent. Right. Uh, because rent yeah. control is based on who lives in a unit, not based on just how long people have been living in a unit. Yeah, yeah, rent control is rough. It's a really perverse incentive because um, it keeps people in bad living situations rather than just moving somewhere else. Yeah, but I guess then you could also apply the switching cost thing to like getting rid of rent, rent control. Might make things even worse. No, I don't think they should get rid of it. I think they should make it apply even to new tenants in the same unit. Okay. So like when, like when you move out, the new tenant should get the same rate that you're paying. That's what I think it should be. Because then you remove this perverse incentive for people to stay in, say, abusive relationships, other bad living situations, and just generally not ha have like a free market that like intelligently finds the solution of like where should people live. It's like they're locked in by this distinction. It's an artificial distinction based on the way the law is worded. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, you're 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 interfering with the free market if you have a blanket rent control too. Mm -hmm. I well, yeah, well, but it, well, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, um, I, I'm assuming that we need some regulation. It's a question of which regulations. So we've already got this right. regulation. If you change it like this, the incentives change in a way that's good. Right. So there'll probably be other um, unforeseen, unforeseen side effects for doing it that way. I'd imagine. I mean, yeah, I guess so. But I mean, I, I haven't heard a good argument in favor of it being that way. I mean. And, and you know, maybe you don't want people moving neighborhoods too much. You don't want the neighborhoods mixing. <laughs> um, I mean, that sounds like a bad argument. Wait, uh, sorry, I don't, I don't understand well, that. Well, because because people people are, people have an incentive to stay in one place because when they move, they'll probably pay more rent okay. because they won't get the, they only get the benefit of the law if they stay put. Okay. So the, the, because the law is the way it makes people stay put, even if it's not the greatest living situation. So, so is the proposal just to make it so, like, gov like government mandate that, um, uh, pr like, land property owners have to charge a lower rent, no matter who? No, no, it, it would still be a limit on the rate of increase. Okay, a limit on the rate of increase. But which is what we have, but it would be tied to the physical location rather than to the person living there. Yeah, I mean, I get it. I mean, I still. S so, so if you get if you get rid of tenants tenants completely, would you be allowed to, to bump it or no. to renovate? No, that's the idea. Well, renov so if it's a renovation, you'd have to make the case that you're actually increasing the value and like the yeah, that's they what do happens. address that's that. What happens in Montreal. I mean, that's a different problem. I'm not saying it solves every possible problem, but yeah, I mean, renovation sometimes the renovation doesn't add that much value as an excuse to raise the rent, um, and you know maybe they should look more carefully at those kinds of applications. Uh, um, but at the very least. Um, I mean, you can let people move yeah. around. And then there's, I've heard arguments that rent control contributes to urban decay. I, I, don't, I mean, it just sort of, it sort of seems like with all these, I like, I'm sympathetic for sure to the rent control argument because like the the ballooning rents is definitely a major problem for young people, but or everyone, um, indeed affecting young people in particular. But it, it seems like. It seems like when you get into the business of like the government trying to solve a social problem by just having the right combination of regulations to sort of force a particular outcome, there's something about that that seems very um, well that, like re re repulsive to me. Like it, it's it's almost like um, it almost seems like um, a, a, an overgrowth of the super ego of <laughs> society in a way. Okay. Like you know what I mean? Like the conscious mind in a way having the arrogance to think it can solve these really complex problems involving millions of people by just thinking up the right um, the right solution and usually it's a solution that's like often these regulations like with the rent control is a great example you put the rent control in place and it seems like okay if there's rent control people will pay less for rent and that'll be good but then there's this side effect of like oh well people can't move out of abusive relationships so that's bad so we're gonna do well, it this way but well, no but not because of that regulation it's it's it would be even harder without that regulation but i'm saying it would be easier if the regulation were different yeah, yeah i um, get it but i'm saying like, if you have a new regulation that's a different regulation there's going to be a different unforeseen side effect i mean i guess the idea is that you're constantly iterating yeah uh and improving yeah. the regulations because because you can't as i was saying earlier you can't solve it all theoretically in the first place you have right. to get it wrong like you have right. to get it wrong with the camera and yeah, yeah. I got it wrong with <laughs> make sure whether it's hey who knows maybe it was recording but yeah, um, but yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, you want to not 
you want to like experiment intelligently and not just like literally try anything. So like you right. need some theory guiding which experiments you even do. Right. Yeah. Because um, otherwise you can waste a lot of resources. It's like, oh, let's try all killing each other. Well, that didn't work. Let's try something else now. <laughs> it's like, where we've tried that in history. Yeah, I but, mean, there, there, there is a certain appeal to, like, an emergent solution, right? Like, when you design yeah. a mechanism that's sort of, like, the water just naturally flows to the right levels. Like, and I guess that's what the free market claims to be. But and when but it can, so when you, it can you be notice, that, it's a beautiful thing. But you notice in this case, if, if, if you made the regulation... Um, specific to the unit, then the people could flow freely and there'd be an emergent solution in terms of who lives where. Um, so it, it actually, I mean, locally, like, comparing the two options, it would create a, an increase, at least one kind of that emergence of a solution. Because right now people are stuck where, they, where they're living. Right. All the new, I mean, the right of the new units being built are expensive and there's crap rent control on those, but um, to incentivize building new units, okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's weird. I, I mean, I mean, I mean, why don't we zoom out to regulation in general? It sounds like you have a lot of misgivings about regulation. Yeah, the I. Concept. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, what about? I mean, well, and, you said, and you said, and you said, all oh, the super ego. I mean, I guess. Okay, actually, okay, I'm gonna, uh, I'm, gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna respond in psychoanalytic terms. What's wrong with the super ego? What do you have against your super ego? I don't have anything against the super ego. I, I think it has an important. Has your role. own super ego been overactive? Oh in man, your life? we're getting into personal. Oh, it <laughs> hey, absolutely, hey, it absolutely hey, you, has. You put Go it ahead. in Freudian terms. No, it absolutely has. Um, I've uh, I've definitely gone through a period of ideological possession where okay. I believe that my conscious mind could um, overpower your solve the, solve the, solve the problems of the world, or that I can I could um, not that I could come up with, but that I could hold in my conscious mind uh, solutions big enough to solve right. the problems of the world. Right, right. Uh, and I've since realized the folly of that. Hmm. So I'm a little we bit... a very limited perspective. It's like each person really holds so much information in their head. Yeah, and each of us is only... Well, the solution... The problems are much more difficult than than they seem to be. I think it's uh, it's easy sometimes to, like, look at the problems of the world and be like, the people in power are just idiots. Like, why can't... like Or, or they're malevolent. They're bringing us down. They're our enemies. They're trying to control us and make money off us and have power over us, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Or, like, the people in power are just doing what they have to do because the system is broken. Um, capitalism is uh, a messed up system, and we just need um, a better system in place. And if we had a better system, then people's natural goodness would come to the surface. You know, all these kinds of ideas that um, the, pro like the, uh, the basic idea, I guess, that I guess at the core of every ideology is something like this is the problem, this is the solution. This solution will fix that problem. Or if it's a totalizing ideology, it'll fix all problems. And um, there's not going to be a drawback. There's not going to be a sacrifice. It's just um, mm. it's just going to be an upgrade for everyone. <laughs> and the reason that we do, what, what, so why don't we do it? <laughs> well, there's the evil people, or there's the We're stopping you from upgrading the evil your people, or the evil system, or the stupid people, or this you know. So, so I don't really think it works that way. I kind yeah. of don't. I don't really think anyone has has the <clears throat> answers right now. Well, yeah, I mean. One way I think I've thought of it before is basically like, I think some people say, okay, there's all these different different perspectives. We need to figure mm -hmm. out which perspective is the best one, mm -hmm. and then use that one. Yeah. And it's like, well, <laughs> maybe we should be using multiple perspectives to make our decisions. I mean, that's the idea of democracy. It's kind of the idea of a free market. If like money is speech, you vote with your wallet or something like that. And like, there's probably kind of a continuum between like economic systems and voting systems like right. you can you know because if you vote with your wallet you know you also in a sense you're buying a candidate with your votes like it's mm -hmm. kind of just different terminology i mean the issue is what's the function you know uh, how, yeah. does it, how does it work not yeah what, for what, sure what yeah. Do you use? yeah yeah sure there's, there's a reason why capitalism <clears throat> and democracy tend to go together why oh for that reason well no that's one reason but i i guess more fundamentally hmm. i guess more fundamentally in either case is the idea like there's a sense of empowering the individual and a sense of personal freedom that's fundamental to both systems mm. and it comes from like the liberal tradition like john Locke, john, john Stuart mill stuff like that yeah i mean you can make epistemic arguments in all those cases um i mean a long time ago i made an argument that someone then told me was the epistemic argument for anarchism before i really thought much in terms of the word anarchism or anything like that um and what does epistemic mean again in cons concerning knowledge so like okay. relating epistemology okay. yeah so like um, well, let me put it this way. Um, 
th this I, I didn't put it this way at the time, but it was like, okay, so most of the information we have um, will never be put into words. Because say we can say a limited number of words in a day, mm -hmm. and there's more information than that in our minds every day, you know, yeah. in terms of like our feelings and thoughts and everything, and and some of it will, can't be put into words at all. But even the stuff that could, there's too much of it. Um, so there's w w the vast majority of the information that we have, humans have, to make decisions on, will never be put into words. So how does that information reach decisions? By letting people do their thing, mm -hmm. instead of being like, no, you must justify. Remember, justify true belief. In order for it to be knowledge, it must be justified to somebody else, probably in verbal terms. Yeah, I mean, I mean there's an idea of norm verbal justification. Okay, hang on, hang on, I'm trying to follow it. So yeah. what, was, what was the first part you said? Okay, so the, yeah, first, all, all the information, most information we have is, you can't verbalize it. Okay. You couldn't verbalize all of it. Maybe some of it you could, but okay. certainly not all of it. And um, the only way to use it then is to let people make decisions non-verbally, like without justifying it to somebody else, giving them freedom to right. act on their intuition, to listen to their body, to act with local information okay. um, and so what that means is that the more freedom you give people in principle that increases how much information can be brought to bear on decision making which is right. kind of like living well is to like bring information to bear on your decisions and inform right. them somehow right and so so freedom is an epistemic virtue it's not just freedom is good because freedom is good it's you, if, if you value knowledge you can value freedom because you value knowledge yeah, yeah, and they exist in a feedback loop to each other in, in several ways. I mean, for one thing, it's like, um, I was just talking to someone about this, like, the idea, like, like the the big um, um, weak, weak point or pain point of democracy is an uneducated populace, mm. right? Like a populace that is lacking in knowledge. <coughs> and similarly for capitalism. Like if you look at... Right, an uninformed consumer. Yeah, I mean, capital vote cap in an informed way with their wallet. Yeah, capitalism basically just amplifies desires, and if someone is uninformed, they're like e e e easily susceptible to advertising. They're giving into their base desires. You end up with capitalism spirals down. It can also spiral up, mm. and so you get like the knowledge feeding into both democracy and capitalism. But at the same time, you also get um, freedom. Freedom spirals back into the individual because, like you were talking about, like an individual that's that's free can. Um, make decisions and take risks and learn from the actions they take and continually like upgrade themselves. So the idea is they should, I guess they can end up in a positive upward spiral together or a downward spiral mm. together. Well, yeah, because I mean the epistemic factor, the knowledge based factor might be um, part what links them there because like I encountered this argument first, this epistemic argument for anarchism, but there's also epistemic arguments for democracy, um, which and wonder, okay, well, how are those connected? Because if, like, it's the same goal, two different... So, I mean, not that anarchism is inconsistent with democracy, but because um, you can basically say... Well, because deliberative democracy is actually kind of similar to the scientific method. Mm -hmm. You can say, uh, well, if you're trying to replicate a study, that's like different labs are voting on the result. Like, oh, yeah, we got the same number when we measured the light beam or whatever. Mm -hmm. And when the results don't match... They don't just say, oh, that vote was the end of the conversation. That's the beginning of the conversation. And they say, okay, now we're going to compare our methods and figure out why we got different numbers. You know, like, did you control for this? Like, you know, which mm -hmm. laser beam generator did you use? Like, you know, right. how many hertz is your AC? You know, like, uh, like the alternating current. You're just troubleshooting some variables, do some debugging. Um, yeah. Oh, I mean, it's, it's more difficult to do that debugging in a collective way, like, as part of all of our political... Uh, it's, discourse. It's, it's such a contrast to the yeah. It's such a contrast how political discourse happens. Yeah, yeah. But, but, I, I guess, but, but, I guess but, but the upshot is that corruption of democracy and corruption of science might be the same corruption because it might be the same process that's being corrupted. This deliberative process. Yeah, I mean, I guess part of where um, the differences occur are in politics. Things often reduce to value and emotion, like we were talking about mm. before. Um, in that footage, that might no longer exist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but. Um, yeah, like in science, let's say, well, actually, now I'm kind of questioning that, but like, let, let's say for now, um, in science, if there's like, uh, we both do the same study and we get different results and we compare, we'll compare, like, we, we view it as, um, it's an epistemic difference in a way. It's, it's, it's purely like um, epistemic, like a, one of us, there was this difference in the study design or in the conditions or in the technology, and we just need to figure out, to figure out what values. the difference is, and it's value neutral, yeah, yeah, as opposed to there's a difference in, in our values, although I can kind of question that in science too, actually. Now I'm sort of, I'm not sure that's actually how science happens. Well, well, look, there's lots of software to, to continue the debugging analogy. I mean, I don't really think of it as an analogy, I guess, because like that probably has like a like software realism or something like weird. 
You're, you're a piece of software. I'm a piece of software. Anyway. Oh, geez. Uh, well, our, our DNA is code, sort of. I mean, I don't know. To the extent that analogy works. Um, there's lots of software that has lots of bugs that don't get fixed, but some of them get fixed. Mm -hmm. The higher priority bugs. Right. And that's, that's value laden right there. I mean, there's lots of mysteries in science, and we work harder on some of them than on others, and those are like bugs. That's like, oh, there's a discrepancy here. Like, this doesn't match up with that. We, we More research is needed, as is always needed. But which which yeah. research is more needed more? Um, I mean, that, that's that's a realist perspective, though. How so? I mean, yeah, I guess so. Well, there's there's um there's a truth and there's an imperfect mo there's an imperfect uh, software we have to. I guess you could say the software exists to, to, to manipulate it to. You could say the same thing if you just thought it was consensus. I mean, I don't. I get. I guess, but then what what are what's the reference point for determining what's a bug and what's a feature? Well, if you get different results, if it doesn't match. Oh, if it doesn't match. Okay, so the bug is just um, internal inconsistencies, and not, At least. not not a lack of correspondence with reality. Well, I mean, it's it's a lack of correspondence between one part of reality and another. Yeah, I guess. I guess. I guess, and then just whatever is science is just defining reality. Sorry. And then whatever is science. Well, there's a, well, there'd be a lot of different ways to do it. That's the thing. So, like, 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 here, like this way, what consensus reality is also depends on the voting system. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. And there's an, it, there's an infinity of possible voting systems. We've tried a very few of them. It, it, so we voted differently. I'd be like, oh, here's reality. Different, different revision. Yeah, I guess just abstract away from the idea of voting for a second to the idea mm -hmm. of how we make decisions about what is reality generally. Like, if we're in this non-realist perspective now where it's, uh, science isn't so much telling us what's what's objectively true about external objects, it's telling us what the consensus is. And there is a bug. Like, it's there's sort of two ways, like, you know, like Thomas Kuhn, like paradigms? Yeah. Like, just a, it's not much reality, but, like, there's the idea, if you're in, like, the space of normal science, and there's, like, this, like, dominant paradigm, and there's, like, this bug, like, we didn't get the result we're supposed to get, like, one way to do it would just to be, like, okay, that result is a bug, okay. we're gonna bring it back to normal, versus if we're doing, okay. if we're doing, I'm just gonna finish explaining so yeah. the can follow. If we're doing um, revolutionary science, we get a bug, and then we say, no, the bug is actually representing this new, different model that we want, that now we're going to fight for that model to become the dominant paradigm. Mm. So it's sort of like... Okay, well, t take a literal software example, the notion of, like, a bug in Facebook. Okay. Now, there's lots of cases where people are like, wait, Facebook does what? It shouldn't do that. And Facebook's like, no, it's supposed to do that. Right. And so there's a difference in values in terms of, is that a bug or is that a feature? Yeah. Right? And yeah. the thing is, people aren't being asked. There, there's no poll. There's right. no, I mean, the polls you can make on Facebook are shitty by design, I think, because, you know, if, if the polls were that sophisticated, people could start setting up the polls themselves for, like, you know, how should we organize to change Facebook, <laughs> you know, but it's, it's not, yeah. they control who views stuff so much, and, like, the options are kind of, compared to what they could be giving people in terms of, like, voting software, it's I mean, I guess, we're, I guess we're, we're voting by using Facebook. Yes, and yes, if you're implicit preferences, implicit, your implicitly, lizard brain, so like to speak. It's, it's more like um, there's a large cost for rejecting Facebook, though. So it's like you either have to accept the it's like a political party, you either have to accept the whole thing. It's almost like more like a country, whether you choose to live in Facebook or not live in Facebook. Huh. Yeah. North Korea. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> uh, if you're not there, you're like trying to there, like what's happening? I don't know what's happening. I mean, that's yeah. like me and Instagram. I don't live on Instagram. Yet. Yeah, which is yeah. really living in Facebook because Facebook owns Instagram. Well, yeah, it's a false alternative. Yeah, it's a, yeah, exactly, false yeah. choice, and that's what some people say that representative democracy is. Oh yeah, yeah, that yeah. Whole line you of need thinking. A lot of options. I mean, yeah, I mean that's kind of where viewpoint diversity comes in, right? Because if all of your candidates have the same platform, then you're fucked, you know, <laughs> so to speak. It's probably not your platform if it's all the same. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting because at a certain level of abstraction, they do have the same platform. Like you see those like political ideology well, charts I mean, where the conservatives have scrapped the carbon tax. <laughs> that's a big difference. Yeah. But that's a government regulation. Yeah, it's a government reg. Yeah. But I mean, what better idea is there? I mean, I, I read a thing once where Naomi Klein was asked why she didn't emphasize carbon taxes and this changes everything, and she said, "Oh, well, I don't want to waste time on something that's silly." because she thought it's politically impossible to get a carbon tax high enough. But of course, right. it's part of the, that seems like a kind of ideological answer though, uh, it does to me. I mean, uh, it doesn't say I don't agree with her claim that the capitalist system needs to be dramatically changed. Um, 
you know, um, we probably should be trying to, the parallel strategy of trying to increase carbon taxes at the same time as trying to, you know, dismantle capitalism. I mean, I guess, yeah, from that perspective, uh, I mean, it definitely seems like climate change is one area where it's hard for me to imagine, like, it's hard to see a non, a non-collectivist solution. Like a non-government. You mean without regulation? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because like there's all these unpriced externalities. Like, yeah, there's probably not going to be an exter- like an emergent solution for climate change, so it's, it's a little rough. But you think that's the exception? I mean... Oh, I definitely I, think it's... Yeah, I think it's probably the exception. But it's hard to say, because... I mean, it depends what it's based on. I mean... Because, I mean, you could also make an epistemic argument for um, free markets... And say that because that's kind of w- what you're getting at, and say like, well, you know, the um, when when the government comes in and sets like a, a fixed thing, or you know, whether it's the ratio between two things, or saying this has to be a maximum, this has to be a minimum, it's it's um, based on not much information. If, if it, for, whereas the market can take up information from every little purchasing decision all over the place and give you this emergent thing, which is supposedly based on more information because it's based on this almost well, like a sensory organ that's out there doing all these activities. Yeah, yeah, the model is the real world, is the idea. Whereas with when the government tries to, like, set all the regulations, it ends up with, like, you know, the idea of combinatorial explosion? Yeah. So, I was just explaining for the audience. So, so it's a combinatorial explosion. It's, like, um, it's the idea that some things, uh, it's the idea that, like, the more units you have, the more the, the relationships between the units grow exponentially. So you can have, like, two units, and it's easy to model all the relationships between them. You can have three, and it's easy to model the relationships between them. But you have, like, a... Uh, hundred and the relationships between them are just ex- like unimaginably yeah. large. Like if the cast of Friends were twice as large, the show would be way more than twice as long. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And even as single friends, then it it becomes like yeah, um, crazy. What like twice as complicated? But yeah. Um. Anyway, so so because that and, and that that is that is it's like it's not a trivial criticism of of planned economies, right? Like, and it's 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 I think we. Most people agree that to a certain extent, that idea that like no. um, a planned economy can't deal with combinatorial explosion, like most people agree with that. It's kind of what went wrong in the Soviet Union. Now, well, I mean, c- the thing is, a carbon tax is still supposed to allow the market to do this thing, just by right. making the putting a price on the unpriced externality. Right. It's just, it's, it's not that it's it's uh, not a job for a market. The argument go, it's just that you, you're not paying a fair price because you're getting something for free and making everyone else pay for it. Right, right, and I think there's definitely an argument for the government. Um, As opposed to like a ceiling on carbon, just be like, this company just can't emit more carbon than that. Like, well, what if they want to pay bazillions of dollars to do it? We could probably, you know, find a way to make use those resources to offset the issue. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I don't have a strong opinion about carbon tax versus cap and trade because I haven't looked into the issue too deeply. But I think there's definitely an argument to be made that government, part of the role of government, is to um, uh, manually enter in um, unpriced externalities into the economy. I think there's an argument for that, but it's it's also like I think there, I think there's well think 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 this way so, suppose suppose you have like a nanny state or something which is going to go around and inspect people's decisions. Now I'm not saying this should happen, but let's just consider this argument for a second. Um, what what would be the um, m- most justified way they could possibly do that? It wouldn't be to go around and say, like, you should be giving the government more money so our wages will be higher. That would be a, a bad way to do it. But um, they could go around and say, um, um, in this decision, you should consider this thing that you would think was relevant. <laughs> you know, if that, if that, and this is a theoretical thing. Right. Um, but, you know, because basically the, the, the critique is... I'm trying to put in epistemic terms in terms of how much information reaches a decision. Okay. So you might say, oh, well, the government doesn't really know what's going on, so they set a maximum price on this, a minimum price on that. They're not really, that information isn't isn't reaching them. And, um, and you might say, well, who are they to say anyway? Um, but when you're trying to, when, like when you're trying to um, debug why people don't agree about something, one thing you might ask is, to have they considered all the same things? Because okay. if one person is considered three things and someone else is considered the exact same three things and they reach a different answer that's different than if like well this person just hasn't considered what that person has considered they just mm-hmm. or they consider only one thing or something like that yeah i definitely like the idea of making denser connections between yeah between people across different opinions but, but so but so a, a really government cool. a government regulation you might say doesn't consider enough because it's not sort of on the ground where all these 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 things are, are, well, are happening well, say it's, it's, it's impossible for the government to actually model all the economic relationships that occur in society because 
the number is unimaginably large. They but think but it's I think exponential. But but I, but I think what you're comparing is. I mean, I'm not saying that you can't make the comparison the way, but I'm saying you're comparing um, uh, the top-down explicit regulation of the government with this, this sort of implicit regulation that happens through the limited perspective of the bottom-up market. Like, it's not like it's not like the bottom-up perspective is omniscient either. Like, you have these two perspectives that are limited in different ways. Yeah. Right? The, the top-down okay, okay, regulation so and the yeah. emergent. The emergent, yeah, the emergent uses the real world as its model. But I guess you're, I guess you're, what you're pointing out is that the the emergent bottom-down model is limited because individuals knowledge is limited yeah actually i was trying to ask you before about the overgrowth of your own superego I, I let you wriggle out of it <laughs> yeah yeah no i yeah no let's get back to that i just want to like, yeah. spend one more minute on this okay. but i think i might be i'd be close to an epiphany here so i guess the difference in the bottle the bottom down model bottom is that up, each, the, bottom, down? the bottom up model is that each each unit is making economic decisions yeah and they have they tend to have some kind of thorough understanding of their immediate environment. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's both the strength and the limitation of, I guess that the top down can do more long-term planning, which is kind of the benefit of the conscious mind. Because the distractions. Yeah, whereas the bottom up, um, like you had stuff in the Soviet Union where there'd be like one factory sending materials to the next factory and they'd be sending materials back to the first factory so they all meet their quotas. Oh God. So it would be like, you know, nothing, <laughs> horrible, like, like nothing would be produced, horrible inefficiencies. And so, that in the in the bottom up model, you're not going to get those kinds of inefficiencies that basically consume the Soviet Union. But I, yeah, I guess I guess you're I guess yeah the point you're making, which is a good point, is that those bottom up units, which might be making they're making decisions that are good in the short. They might be they might be a risk of them making new decisions that are only good in the short term, or that are locally good. But that could collectively be moving things in a negative direction. Yeah, I mean, you can put this a little more generally. The good based on local information, which might mm -hmm. be a short-term thing. It yeah. might be. It might be just whatever that information is, because the two perspectives have different information. Different information ends up being useful for different things. Right. So it might be that the people who have this information, i.e., the people working from the bottom-up direction, might be mm -hmm. the same people at different times, but have have the information that's 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 more relevant. I mean, I would say in line with some kind of methodological anarchism. You can imagine a theoretical state where there's no government regulation, and then you say, okay, for each regulation that you add, how do you justify it? But that's mm -hmm. kind of the historical process of what we had, is that, you know, actually America used to be more of a, a, a free market, uh, you know, before FDR and everything, you know. It's like, yeah. um, it turned out we needed some of those regulations, so, like, now some of them exist. Right. I mean, now, of course, you could go back and some of the arguments were probably wrong, and some of those regulations were wrong, but, you know, um, it doesn't mean that you can't, the th you can get the method wrong of trying to justify power differences, but it doesn't mean the method is wrong. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's probably the right way to think of it. The, the issue is that like every time, you know, someone's born into a society, I mean, I don't know all the arguments behind every government regulation that affects me, but I hope there are some, and I hope they're good. I yeah. mean, you know, but they, in some cases they're bad, and, and occasionally people realize, oh, wait a second, like for instance, like the marijuana. People were like, oh, there must be some, in fact, many people just kind of assume that because it's illegal, there must be some great reason for it. You know, this is it's an implicit kind of authoritarianism of like might is right, but might has said no weed, therefore weed must be bad because otherwise might would not be right. And, right. you know, and therefore, you know, X, Y, Z people are bad, which was part of the idea in the first place, um, you know. And so people are born into a system with pre-existing regulations and they weren't there for the argument that went into it being made in the first place. Yeah. And people aren't taught, people aren't brought up to speed and be like, oh, here, here, here's how we justified all the restrictions on your freedom. And I think right. to the extent a parent or a teacher can do that, I mean, the state doesn't do a very good job of it currently of, of justifying uh, the, the ways of the state to man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I, I, it kind of comes back to what you are talking about before, which I really liked, is this idea of creating denser connections between, the idea is like uh, you, you sort of poll what everyone's opinions are and then you try to connect people. Yeah, based on who should hash out a disagreement. Yeah, like who, yeah who, who's not too, follow, too far apart that they'll just descend into yeah. name calling and who's not too close together that they'll just be in like, Yeah, yeah, you're so right, oh my God, you're so right, yeah. You're so smart, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and that's cool because it, like, it seems like one solution to this sort of the risk of the bottom up, which is just that good local decisions are made. But um, Yeah, the problem is how you measure that distance. There's a million different ways to, to compute that metric. You know, like how do you measure the distance, and, and what is the, how do you measure what the distance should be? 
for, for different for people the, to talk? Or? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a, that's a what's risk. The, what's that threshold? I feel like more people talking is good. Well, so I mean, a risk is a problem. You have to try a bunch of different ways, I think. It's good to like, create medium, medium length connections so like the local decision makers aren't just making decisions locally, they're taking into account. I think it's just part of the, ju- part of the rationale for free speech. Is yes. You have like, the smarter local decision makers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I believe the whole sunlight is the best disinfectant adage. You know, not, I'm not a huge proponent of no platform. I mean, obviously, it's a tactical consideration, but like most of the time, like, come on, just like w- let, let the best ideas win here. I mean, right. Um, yeah, I just agree. Um, yeah, so you wanted to go back to super ego. Oh, yeah. So, well, yeah, because you have this um, concern about government regulation, and you described it as like an overgrowth of the super ego. I think it can definitely be. Okay, but I, and I asked you if you felt, oh yeah, because you said you felt your superhero had overgrown in the past. Yeah. All right, and then I gave the example of like, yeah, it's not a matter of just choosing one perspective, but okay, so, and so you're treating the, the basically, I think on that model, it's kind of like the image is you have all these individuals making different decisions, and there's this one other individual who's the government regulator. And that one person's perspective shouldn't weigh so much compared to all these other people's perspective. But it's different if that regulator was elected, say, by everybody else. Yeah. Right? Because then they are the result of a combination of perspectives. It's not this one person saying this is what you should all do. Yeah, yeah, I think. But then how how true that is depends on the voting system. Yeah, like, I'm not an anarchist. Like, I don't think there should be no government and just a free, like, I'm not an anarcho-capitalist or anything, Mm -hmm. but... Um, I think there needs to be balance, balance between like uh, the government, which is it is a privileged voice and it does it's part of its role is to look into the long term, and to look in look at the more global perspective or the, the top down perspective, like uh, like as the conscious mind does, mm-hmm. like as the super ego, the you know the super ego is not a bad thing; it has a role, mm-hmm. and then the people are more um, they tend to act locally, but the more that they can create those medium term long-term connections between each other and the more that each individual unit is powerful the more society thrives as well mm. and I um, yeah I mean I guess sometimes I just uh, I sort of react to the person I'm talking to and so it's like when I'm talking to people who are like super against regulation sure. I tend to justify it more when I talk to people who are super for regulation uh-huh. I tend to be more critical but well I'm not uh, super for or <laughs> I, 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 I'm I, I, non yeah, super no, yeah no I'm not trying to make judgment I guess I think in Canada um, sometimes there's a a thirst for regulation beyond what is necessary. It seems to me. So what's the worst regulation you've encountered in Canada? In my, can- like in my I, personal I, life? Or? I mean, the regulation of weed was a bit much, but that's not specific to Canada. We, we were the first to get rid of it, technically. Yeah, it's not federally. specific to Canada. Um, oh, boy. I mean, I think we got some weird laws in Canada. Uh, I mean, Bill C-16, I think, is definitely a problem. Which one is that again? The religious headdress? No, oh, no, no. I mean that one's a problem too. Get my numbers the religious, straight. religious oh, headdress in Quebec. That one's the one um, regulating. Um, it's a good law generally because it's like providing um, protected rights to trans people. Oh. But the problem is there is uh, some concern that the law could be used to um, basically make misgendering a hate crime. Right. So that was the whole Jordan Peterson's um, kind of went on a crusade against that, and I have a lot of sympathy for what he's saying. About that. He, he didn't. He examples. didn't put it well at first, which is a part of part of what went wrong, mm-hmm. because he, he he changed slightly what he was saying. Yeah. I mean, I think he was clarifying what he meant, right? Um, as opposed to you know, bringing up, changing and backing down from his truth. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I could say a lot about that, but yeah, no, I mean, I feel wanted. like it's finally it's finally fallen out of the podcast realm. This time. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I, I guess it has. I mean. I still find it interesting, but yeah, it's um, his perspective is incomplete. That's for sure. Okay. And as and as you as you get out from his area of expertise into broader political realms, it seems like, well, you know, he wriggled out of a debate with Richard Wolff, the economist I was mentioning earlier. Okay. Um, and well, and actually, in his debate with Zizek that you were coming on that uh, thing that I watched earlier that you sent me. Um, I mean, I don't think a lot of substance was really addressed. I mean, Not really. I mean, he didn't know he was going to debate him. He was really familiar with his work or whatever. But like, I mean, um, he had said this thing before of like, "Oh, no Marxist is willing to debate me," and apparently Richard Wolff 
heard that and was like, I'll debate this guy. I don't care who he is. He didn't really know much about Peterson at the time. And there was a conference. You can see this Richard Wolf talking on Primo Nutmeg on YouTube. Um, I think he explains it. The, uh, there was a student conference devoted to the work of Jordan Peterson. There was just all, it was all about his work. And yeah. so people were coming to comment, and he was invited, and he was supposed to debate Richard Wolf at this event. And then, like, um, for some reason, his speaking fees went way up. Oh. And according to Richard Wolf, the student group thought that he did that deliberately to get out of the event without actually canceling. Huh. Yeah. Because what's funny is I learned this after I already thought, Peterson really needs to debate Richard Wolf. And then I mm -hmm. found out Peterson does not agree. He thinks he needs to not debate Richard Wolf, apparently. Huh. Yeah. So. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. That's really interesting. I didn't know about that. Because it's not as, I mean, it's very, in psychological terms, Peterson's can, he's given to black and white thinking sometimes. And guess what? Richard Wolf's position is kind of nuanced because it's, like I was saying earlier, you can have a worker on cooperative in our current capitalist legal system. You don't have to have this other system which produces these results. I mean, if it's, I mean, if, if the whole concern is that, like, oh, yeah, communism leads to the gulag, it's like, well, then I guess our current laws lead to the gulag because worker on cooperatives are currently legal. And just, they just aren't as successful as they could be, in part due to not enough commitment to doing them, you know, understanding the stakes and, you know, how it affects income inequality, for example. I mean, I guess so. I mean, I could make the argument that uh, state communism leads to gulags and that the reason workers co ops are marginal is that uh, they tend not to outcompete um, regular for profit businesses. Well, yeah. I think it might, it, it's. it's I think it could be largely a failure of imagination. I mean, I mean, I mean, everyone's heard a million people talk about this or that business idea. You almost never hear anyone talk about an idea for a cooperative. Right. It's just not there in the imaginative landscape. Uh, and I don't know. I, I, I see a lot of things as kind of failures of imagination. You I know? mean, Because there's so many uh, possibilities compared to what we've had the time to think about. Like, we've only been on this planet for a while. I guess so. I mean, I've worked in worker-run co-ops, and I've worked mm. in regular businesses, and... I would not want to start a workers' run. I would not Why? want to be. I would not want to do it again. Why? Um, You'd rather start a business. Yeah, I'd much rather start a conventional business. Why? I think one of the problems with a worker-run co-op is, well, there's there's no hierarchy of competence. Oh, there can be. Actually, so here's an example that somebody recently told me was a good example, so I'll use it. Okay. <laughs> um, if you had a like a. I don't know anything about football, but so as you had a football team that was, decisions were made by the players, okay. and they have to decide um, who to hire as a quarterback. Okay. Well, they want to win. Right. And so it's going to make an objective difference um, in someone's actual abilities. There'll be a hierarchy of competence in the preferences of the players for who they're hired to join the team. I get that. Um well, one issue is once people are already on board, you end yeah. up in a situation where um, if you had, like, the board or whatever, what, what we had, and, um, it's like, let's say I was responsible for running a whole branch of the company, let's say, and so I would have an idea, like, okay, this and this and this is what we have to do, and then I'd be talking to people, and even for small day-to-day -day decisions, an area of the business where they were, had no involvement, everyone had a say, so it just made it made decision making extremely slow. It wasn't modular. Right, it enough. wasn't modular, and, and we get it so gets, as it gets, I say, it depends on the voting system. It, it, it was like stuff that really was really annoying, where it's like, oh well, is it you know just people would bring people would be virtue signaling a lot, and it just yeah. made it really hard to make decisions. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of ways you could do it poorly. That's for sure, mm -hmm. um, you know. And um, I mean, I used to be in situations in student politics where we uh, we tried really hard to do everything by complete consensus, which made everything mm -hmm. really slow. So that ex the extreme, and it was a good kind of test of that extreme. If you try to do every decision by complete consensus, that would be much slower than if you tolerate some kind of disagreement. But right. I mean, what if your first vote was on how to divide up the decision making, right. right? Because then it's still you still have this modul modularity. Where there's like this is your job, this is my job. I have control over this decision, you have control over this decision, and then there's a separate discussion for if you're changing that authority, you know, like, I'm okay, not saying okay, that's all their thing, but it's an example of how you could ask okay. the question in a different order. Okay, but see, how is that, I don't see how that's different, though, then, it doesn't seem like that different from just starting a regular company, because if I'm starting a company with my friends, we have three founders, and we're like, okay, we're going to divide up the responsibilities this way, this way, and this way. Well, it's the, the difference that Richard Wolf emphasizes is when it goes public, and then you have shareholders. 
I, I, I guess, but I mean, I mean, let's say if we keep it at the small business level, though, like if I'm starting a company with some co-founders, if I make it, you know, at that point, it's basically a workers' co-op before we've hired anyone. Well, because there's just, there's just, let's say there's just the three of us, we're all sharing the basic founding shares equally, mm-hmm. and we're all doing a roughly equal amount of work, as is often the case with at founder level companies. And I mean, what, what? I guess it's the questions of like, what, like, why should it always be like? I, th- I kind of want to reserve the freedom to just hire someone to do a job without giving a piece of the company to them, or maybe I want to reserve the right to like, um, let's say, um, me, Bob, and Mary are starting a business. Let's say Mary's doing most of the work. Maybe Mary should get a bigger share. Mm. Maybe she should get a bit more money. Like, it, why should it always? Have, yeah. have you ever heard of something called nomic? By it's a philosopher named Peter Suber. He wrote a book called *The Paradox of Self-Amendment*, okay. and in it he defined a game called Nomic, and um, it's also about voting. Okay. Um, the the basic, I mean, he has a complicated version of it. It's been pared down to other versions. There's one called Minimal Nomic, one called Pure Nomic, okay. um, and uh, the simplest version is uh, all players must agree on all changes to the game state okay. at all times. And so you can vote in new rules, you can vote to change the wording of that rule, um, and you could vote to change it to an authoritarian system, you know, um, you could vote uh, maybe that new players don't get to vote on the rules, okay. you know, or you could vote that new players do get to vote in the rules or only on certain ones, or, you know, maybe there's a vote on, on which votes a new player gets based mm-hmm. on their performance in the game or something like that. Um, but sort of the idea is sort of at the bottom level, it's democratic. And you can still use that setup to implement something authoritarian if everybody agrees that that's, a, that's what you need to get the job done. Right. Right? Um, but it's having that flexibility of imagination of actually trying... Obviously, market pressures make that difficult, which is why I think we need experimentation in other contexts as well. You know? Um, yeah. What? I, I mean, if you're doing stuff that's not I mean, the market's to experimental, money, too. You don't always have to be in the market, though, right? Like, we could be, like... Uh, People could do it in virtual realms and stuff, like, you know, experimenting with different voting systems on, like, who's, like, president of World of Warcraft or whatever. Or, or, like, know, which, orc, be, which orc is president? You know, non-market stuff happens all the time, right? Like, we could bring a group of friends together and yeah. go out for a night on the town, right? And there's going to be decision-making processes happening. Like, mm. um, there's a lot of different ways we could do it. We could set an agenda and be like, come on, guys. Or we could be like, Schedule. who wants to do what? Um, and that's a non-market, but I mean, but yeah, like, but like that sort of thing where like no mix. Or how to run a like, protest or something like yeah, that. Yeah, oh God, yeah, that's, uh, that's been there, done that. Um, but no though, it sounds a lot like just starting a, tr- it, I guess that's sort of the thing with like starting a company. Yeah, I guess there's value in being open to all kinds of different ways that it could look, all kinds of different configurations. Well, I mean, there's a specific argument that Wolf makes Hopefully I'm getting it right here. It's basically that, um, yeah, the second part I think he makes. Anyway, it's basically like, well, if it's one shareholder, one vote, rather than one worker, one vote, that perpetuates income inequality because the decisions are biased by how much money the people making them have. So if, if rich people are making the decisions, they're going to make decisions which tend to make rich people stay rich because they're going to vote to perpetuate their situation. Yeah. And then the second part is basically um, this corrupts democracy at the ballot box because it creates so much income inequality that it's easy to buy votes. Yeah, there's yeah. um there's an argument um, from like a an ANCAP perspective that this mm-hmm. is the fault of government regulation. The idea that the legal structure of limited liability corporations mm-hmm. uh, protects shareholders mm-hmm. from you know basically. Uh, legal liability and what their business does. So they basically they get all the, the nice profits so they don't get any liability.